John, that that um, slide you had at the end about uh, what people desire and what they don't. I'm sure if you ask them whether they'd rather live in the Bahamas or in Manchester as well, then a much higher proportion would rather live in the Bahamas. But mm. the reality is they can't afford to do so. And uh, yeah. probably it wouldn't be sustainable if most of the population of Britain went to the Bahamas. So, you know, you've got to be careful about how you phrase those questions. If you familiar with the show Yes Minister, you can ask a question to get 60% of the population to support conscription or be against it. And so um, I think it's, it's very careful when we're having this debate about energy in Australia that we make sure we don't try and polarise public opinion by asking the wrong sort of questions. And I think that was exactly the wrong sort of question. If you said, how would you like a 30 metre wind turbine outside of your backyard? Or how would you like a coal fired power station in your local area? You'd probably get much the same response. Oh, but I, I agree with this. I mean, there is a lack of research in Australia on uh, that's equivalent to the British or European experience in relation to perceptions of various different energy futures. But I'd have to say, uh, in my own judgment, political judgment, is that uh, we are an extraordinarily polarised community in Australia around the nuclear option, and we shouldn't ignore that. Um, because it could be an enormous constraint to the roll rollout of any significant nuclear presence in Australia. And we, we need to be aware of that, I think, um, because we don't want to slow down um, any substantial actions in relation to other alternatives in Australia uh, by obscuring it in a really unproductive debate around nuclear or other options, because uh, I, I fear that, um, particularly with the rise of the Greens uh, in the Australian Parliament, um, that uh, there is no real prospect of resolution of the nuclear question in Australia in the, in the foreseeable future. But maybe Ian can comment on this. The only way you'll get nuclear power in Australia, and I don't want to turn this into just nuclear debate, but the only way you'll do it is if the Labor Party proposes it, because you need to have bipartisan support. What does that do to the Greens then? I mean, if, if Labor and the Coalition both support it, it happens. I don't think Labor will go anywhere near it. Well, why are they talking about it? I think there will be debate. I think, I think there'll be, there's definitely a, a, a debate within Labor about it, um, and I think th that will be confined uh, to the export of uranium, um, and that will... But we already export uranium. No, 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 no but, but I think we'll, we'll continue to export uranium and expand uranium exports, uh, but at the end of the day, I, I think while there's a debate within Labor about a nuclear future, I don't think it will manifest itself in a, um, a uniform view within Labor about moving towards um, the nuclear option. Since when has Labor I ever been about uniform views? I don't think it'll be a uniform view, but I think there might well be a majority view because they've got nowhere else to go. If, if we're serious about CO2 emissions, there's nowhere else to go. Sorry. That, that, that's so the so long that, that came back to that question I asked but um, right near the end of your talk. If it was 25 reactors, we probably need 100 reactors to replace both electricity and oil if we're going to go down the synthetic oil path. What do you do for the other 75 reactor equivalent? Well lot of possibilities. Uh, I really just used the 25 figure because that was in the Ziggy, Ziggy's report mm. uh, and um, it's a big ask but it's not an impossible ask and in fact 25 uh, 1500 megawatt reactors exactly replace the current coal-fired capacity in Australia of 36 gigawatts. Uh, so it's an interesting figure from that point of view. But the interesting thing coming back to public opinion is Australia is I think the only one of the top 30 economic countries in the world that's not using yet nuclear power, point one. And it's the only country I know of, with, or at least of its significance, that where there's no organisational advocate for nuclear power in the country. There are a number of organisational advocates against it uh, <laughs> in terms of the green groups on an ideological basis, but nothing. there's no organisational advocate, just a few individuals. Interesting. Mm. And um, we'll get to the public question soon. After we've had the panel on. Okay, quickly. Oh, well, thank you. I just wanted to say that, as someone who was on the Aldermaston marches with Bertrand Russell, totally anti-nuclear, and I agree that, and I have changed, and I think public opinion is changing, because the Aldermaston marches were more about banning the bomb. It was the fear of the, you know, nuclear annihilation more than the actual, the reason we would be using it today for energy. And I, I'd just like to make that comment, that public opinion, I feel, towards nuclear, and I think <coughs> it's backed up by the figures that you gave. So. 
before mm. I go to catch my bus. Well, that, that, that does raise an interesting point that we're talking about energy futures here and we're talking about you know, large scale transitions. And Ian, you brought up the point about the French making a large scale transition from having virtually no nuclear to having 59 reactors within a period of 25 years. How was French public opinion changed? Like, they must have been in a situation where they didn't think one way or the other about nuclear back in the early 70s. What was the sort of government program there to educate the public? I don't think there was a government program. I think the French just get on with things when they decide to do them. <laughs> Um, and the public uh, tag along. And you've got, an, uh, you've got a very strong anti-nuclear movement in France. Very strong, very vocal, but it's confined to, you know, 5 10% of the population, something like that. And you'll find that sort of rump of strongly ideologically anti-nuclear and anti... Uh, very interesting, it's very, very closely correlated with anti-genetic anti modified food to anti-GM sort of um, thinking uh, in any country. You'll always have that. You'll have it in the Labor Party forever and ever and ever, uh, unless all those people defect to the Greens to the, uh, off to the left. But, um, and, and uh, you know, the, you'll never have a consensus in the Labor Party. You'll probably ne never have a consensus in the Liberal Party about it either, if it comes to that. But the interesting thing is, internationally, the number of leading environmentalists, people who've made their reputation, founder of Greenpeace, Patrick Moore, Stuart Brand, Whole Earth Catalogue, uh, James Lovelock, uh, and you can ro roll off a whole lot of names, high-profile environmentalists who are pro-nuclear. Not because they love it, but because the alternatives, in their view, are much worse. And, but these are all people who are no longer at the helm of organisations which rely for raising funds on a certain demographic, shall we say. Could I just ask, you, you, say you, you say the alternatives are much worse. In some countries, yes, they might be, but in, would you say the same for Australia for solar? Why would you consider the, uh, that to be worse? Uh, the, the alternatives uh, I'm referring to are not solar, <laughs> which, I'm, which I'm a fan of, um, but the alternatives are uh, global warming. Oh, OK, right. In other words, you've got to find some way of providing large-scale baseload power at an affordable price. And that's, that's the real issue. I'm a great fan of solar, and, and if, you, if you look at my paper on the web on renew, renewable energy technologies and electricity on the WNA website, you'll see some fairly positive things there about solar, and I hope they're fairly up to date too, okay. to not tell me. Uh, <laughs> but no, but, but look, you know, the, the, and, but you've seen Peter's graph there, and, that, and that's, that's a lot of food for thought in that graph. I'll see if I can pinch it from him sometime. Um, but um, it's, you know, the, 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 there, are, there are other issues involved in terms of scale, energy density, and so forth. And, and Peter, what about the, the situation for renewables in Australia? We've talked about impediments <coughs> for nuclear. Like in France, there's a strong anti-nuclear movement. There's a strong but minority anti-wind movement, for instance, in right. Australia. And probably, I mean, there isn't an anti-solar movement because no, really we haven't no. done any solar yet. But <laughs> when, we get, when we get to the well, point where we're starting to build a large-scale solar plant, now how are we going to deal with that, do you think? An, an excellent point, um, Barry and I actually have talked to, to uh, my friends at the, uh, uh, at the Australian Wildlife Conservancy um, uh, who have uh, properties all over Australia. and. Um, and I've asked them that exact question. I've said, where in Australia could you just build very large solar installations where nobody would bat an eye the energy? And uh, uh, it's actually not that easy to find them, but there, there, are, there are degraded cattle stations that are quite big enough to take a solar, uh, you know, large solar sort of installations where that, that land has already been knocked about so much that no, no environmentalists uh, are going to be worried about that from converting the solar into a solar power station. So I think that there is a lot of, there is the land of available in our little area. There might be also the issue of native title, and I don't know how that all would work, but... Um, what about all the people who come out and protest against the destruction of the Steiger fauna and the Nullarbor when you dig your giant dams? When it, there will always be this element, no matter where you go and what you try and do? Absolutely, yeah. Well, uh, you, you could see that the, that the size even of the solar in component was quite small, even, it's, it's pretty small than the size of the Nullarbor. The dams are actually much, much smaller than that. They're, I mean, they're, they're a few kilometres across, but they're not you know, hundreds of kilometres across. I think you'd be able to find plenty of places where you could dispose. 
still going to put transmission lines through? Oh, uh, you've got to put the transmission lines through. Yeah, we've got railway lines cr crossing the country so, and roads, so I don't know. So how do you see, if we went through a large-scale solar society, how do you see the, the situation evolving? So we've got a situation today where we're all coal, basically, with a bit of ex extra. We've got this hypothetical situation in 2050 or 2060, 2080, whatever, where we've gone to this solar society. How have we evolved from one point to another? How do we make that transition, well both economically and socially? You use the expression evolve, which, uh, you know, for an engineer, maybe it, it's not the best way to, to design a system to, to let it evolve, but this, this does happen, of course, mm. um, in technology all the time. But when you design big things, it's, it's, it's much better to plan them and design the whole thing as a, as a complete system rather than just let it evolve. So, so John, doesn't that invoke a whole bunch of new socio-political implications? If you've designed a system and said, right, this is the way it's going to be and this is how we roll it out and sorry guys, but that's just the way it is. I mean, so sure. I agree with Peter that yeah, um, yeah. ideally you'd, you'd plan it out and I mean, you always leave some yeah. margin for adaptation. You know, as things change and costs go down or costs go up, whatever. But yeah. if you want to do it efficiently, you've got to tell people the way it is and then do it. Well, is that possible? Yeah, well, look, it's, it's difficult. We do need some sort of energy consensus, I suppose, in Australia. It's difficult to strike that balance, and I suppose that's one of the reasons why I put up those slides around perceptions, because that's what we've got to grapple with. That's the reality. We need to engage with those perceptions and, and, um, and shape an energy mix that is, is cognizant of those sorts of perceptions. But at the same time, you've got to... You've got to, you know, you do have to provide some leadership. Um, uh, look, I think what's fascinating in Australia is the take-up of, um, of PV, um, household PV. That tells us a little bit about people's, uh, people's uh, desire for control and engagement uh, at a behavioural level. You know, getting it on your, on your roof, having it there, uh, gives you a sort of sense of security, even though that may not be the answer, and, and it isn't the answer. Uh, it, it, is, it tells you a lot about people's uh, desire to want to engage in, in uh, having some greater control about their energy future, which is in contrast to the big sort of engineering solution to, to energy futures. But, but it is interesting, um, Peter and I were just talking about this over a beer before the, the session, and in fact we agreed um, that if everyone had a one kilowatt photovoltaic system on their roof, it would provide less than 1% of our total energy that's use. Right. So people feel great about those sort of things, but in the end, they're not the thing that's going to make the difference. It's no. going to be the large scale one. No, and for something like that, um, that Beyond Zero Emissions Plan that, that Peter talks about, um, they've gone bold and big and fast, you know, and they've said, let's, let's do 100% renewables by 2020, which will be a hypothetical cost and this is the way the system might work and so on. But there are a lot of social compromises built into that plan. Mm. No one has more than one car, no one's allowed to fly anywhere anymore. Uh, you've cut energy <laughs> use by about 70%. Well, I don't no, well that, no, 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 that's absolutely stated in the plan that there's no, no more air flight. Nobody's going to fly anymore. Well, it, well, air flight, essentially no one has any allocation to, to, to have any air yeah, flight. I, 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 I don't know if I would take all the things, uh, you know, I agree with the, the technology of the plan. I would, I'm not sure if I would take those aspects of the plan that seriously. Uh, but it doesn't work without them. Well, <coughs> I think that the impressive thing about the, the plan is that they've shown that the technologies already exist today. They're concentrated basically on te technologies that are off the shelf today. Uh, leave, let's leave the, the demand side out of it and, and the public, what, what the public are prepared to put up with. The technologies exist today to produce the power uh, using solar and, and wind, uh, and the, you know they're using uh, technology that is already uh, the stuff that's already being built right now. But even that's debatable, you know. I mean, I don't want to get into the details sure. here, but but the wind turbine they chose, the Enercon, um, is, is not being built anywhere. It's, it's they've chosen chosen one which they would hope would be most economic. Well, I'm not saying you couldn't have a smaller turbine, but yeah, well they've also they chosen these demonstration molten salt plants from Spain, of which have received very large subsidies to build them. So, sure, they're, they're theoretically possible, but they're not being rolled out on a large scale. And this is an interesting question with all of these technologies. Um, solar thermal, wind, um, even nuclear in, um, in many developed countries right now, all of them require some sort of subsidy to be built in place of fossil fuels. And um, 
And this invokes decision making on the behalf of governments and so on, because unless you provide a subsidy beta carbon tax, or be it Whoa. mandatory renewable energy target or whatever, mm. um, how does governments and how does society choose what subsidies we will and won't accept? Mm. Well, I think that we should, we should look, look back a bit at the way that things were done uh, in, a, in an earlier generation when we began to look at the Snowy Mountain scheme. Uh, and we used to have, in Victoria at least, uh, the, sta the State Electricity Commission. And the sta State Electricity Commission basically sort of, uh, looked at the needs of the state and, uh, and provided a service, very, a very stable service, uh, at, a, at, a, at a good price. Um, of course, they had their own issues, which was unionism and so on, and, and a bit of over, over staffing and so on, but they were, they were pretty good. Uh, and they, they had a long-term vision. And that's what we don't have today. What we don't have today is, is any kind of plan. We just have this, you know, free for all market forces all sorted out. But then we make it even worse by sort of preferentially uh, subsidising this or that, not on the basis of some engineering decision, mm -hmm. but because some politician thinks that that's going to get some more votes. Mm, absolutely. So, and so an example of that is the rooftop solar, uh, which you know, as, as we discussed, produces very little, less than 1%, but that is the focus. That's what people think about when they, you talk about solar. They think, oh, panels on my roof. Well, that's the wrong thing to be thinking because if you were gonna spend that sort of money that we, we spent, uh, and you put that into large scale solar, we would have got seven times as much power for it. Mm -hmm. But a big issue here is economy for scale too, and because of the perverse way in which you know subsidies to the coal industry have operated historically, it's very difficult, isn't it, for you know renewables to compete in that environment. But I would expect over the next 10, 15 years, uh, for, for all sorts of pump priming and subsidisation of renewables to occur, as the debate around climate change intensifies, so there'll be, so there'll be political decisions that are made. Uh, to win elections around mm -hmm. these sorts of questions. Uh, they'll just overtake us, I think. They will overtake us.